Mr. Billen is a high-ranking member of the Evil League who fights on a daily basis to eradicate humanity and claim the Earth. Unlike other groups, they have days off. On one such occasion, Mr. Billen finds himself at the zoo. As the general joins the queue to see the pandas, he confesses that his days off start with a great dinner and a feast for the eyes. He adores visiting to the zoo and watching the pandas. As he shoots several successive photos of the creature, the youngsters are perplexed. One of the little brats calls him out for overdoing it. He ignores the child because he's too preoccupied with how to raise the panda population once humans is extinct. After capturing the photo, he moves away to avoid being noticed by any co-workers. However, on this special day, Mr. Villain must also keep an eye out for the rangers. They are fools who insist on opposing the evil league at all costs. He recognizes their abilities, as these power rangers usually battle successfully when he confronts them. However, the general would never engage them on his day off. Suddenly, a hand taps his shoulder. He turns, and a young man guesses Mr. Villain is a member of the Evil League because he senses the villain's power. The soldier is pleased to have discovered him while on patrol and introduces himself as Ranger Don Red. He challenges the villain to a battle and is shocked when the general proposes a day-long truce. The villain admits that he adores pandas and does not want to fight in their presence because it would terrify them. The ranger admits to enjoying the creatures. The general notices the aquarium tickets in his palm and speculates that the red ranger ended up to the zoo by mistake. The ranger admits he has a lousy sense of direction. Mr. Villain takes him to the train station and shows him how to get to the aquarium. After a day at the zoo, Mr. Villain heads to the convenience shop. As he enters, we see how he appears on duty versus off duty. The shopkeeper greets him while stocking some magazines, but he notices the limited edition magazine with a panda. He purchases a black coffee beverage and some cup noodles. However, he can't find the red sweet potato soft serve in the ice cream aisle. A strawberry machai bar has taken its place. As he searches for his favored goods, he becomes increasingly angry. The shop attendant observes his dismay, but she hopes he chooses another goods. Mr. Villain selects the machai bar and vows to make humanity pay if it tastes awful. When it comes time to pay for his purchases, the attendant is pleased to see him choose an alternative. She engages in small talk and tells him that he will appreciate it. The lady becomes concerned owing to his lack of response, but she relaxes when he tells her that he would follow her advice. He returns home, tries the ice cream, and enjoys it. He even considers leaving the store as the last item to be destroyed when they finally eliminate humanity. Mr. Villain awakens to another off day and checks his refrigerator only to discover that he only has egg and milk. After finishing his breakfast, he recalls falling in love with pandas when visiting the zoo to learn about the many creatures present on Earth and to see if humans had an experimental facility on the premises. He ended the day as a huge enthusiast of pandas and other fluffy creatures. His flashback has ended, so he goes to the grocery. Red confronts him just as he enters. The ranger thanks him for his assistance during their previous encounter and presents the general with a box of panda cookies as a token of gratitude. He grabs the biscuits and walks away. The ranger wonders if the truce is still in place on that particular day. Mr. Villain ignores him and enters the shop, reminding himself that he does not work on his days off. That night, he reflects on how much he cherishes his free time above all else. He adds quality sleep to the list of must-haves, but the most important thing to remember is to avoid work whenever possible. He's currently enraged since he worked all week and was looking forward to having a curry on his day off, but the shop only offered the extra spicy version, not the mild one. He can't eat it and is so irritated that it appears he is about to go on an elimination frenzy. But surprisingly, a panda special begins to air, calming him down. Even he acknowledges that on that day, cuteness saved the world. On another day off, he goes the mall and is abruptly grabbed by his coat. He believes it is an enemy attack, but then notices Mugi and Sora calling him daddy while gripping his coat. However, the children know he is not their father. Soon after, Mr. Favillan is escorted to the food court, where the children want ice cream. When he asks if their parents have taught them not to accept food from strangers, they answer him no. As they approach, he informs them that they will be receiving their ice cream in cups, rather than cones because it is safer to drop. The youngsters dispute, claiming that cones are cooler, and after a stare down, Dad concedes and buys the ice cream for them. But he advises them not to drop the ice cream. The attendant assumes he's their father and smiles as he observes their contact. Mr. 
villain assures the children that they would be heading directly to the Lost Children's Center next. The twins thank him enthusiastically, making it clear that he is a stranger and not their father. For a brief period, the server's expression was filled with horror. The general warns the children not to call him that in public. The server sighs a sigh of relief as she overhears Mugi declare he's only kidding. As they walk to the Lost Children's Center, Sora's ice cream falls. She starts crying, so her brother proposes that Mr. G villain get her a crepe to cheer her up. They beg, calling him Mr. Zumi Stranger, who is not their father, loudly. This draws the attention of the other shoppers, who whisper among themselves. He asks the children not to address him in this manner. After cheering her up, he leads them to the lost children area, where they say their last goodbyes. He tells them to remain close to their father going forward. The general is certain they will never meet again since, by the time they grow up, humanity will have vanished, but he swears to remember the warmth of their tiny hands. As Mr. Villain walks away, Mugi and Sora's demeanor shifts. The girl comments that he wasn't as evil as she expected. Her brother informs out that the enemy also has a diverse cast of characters. They tell that they were only studying Mr. Villain for the time being, and that their next meeting will be different. Red interrupts their talk and expresses his gratitude for their arrival. The children are impressed that he managed to go to the Lost Children's Center on his own. The ice cream waiter sees the kids leaving with Red and is surprised to learn that Mr. Villain is not their father. The twins notify him that they must return home, else Blue and Pink will be concerned. Meanwhile, Mr. Villain is distracted with a pop-up panda fair and the guy decides to purchase every type of merchandise available. A new recruit has arrived at Evil League headquarters and is eager to begin working with the organization. The soldier is overjoyed to have been assigned to Mr. Gita Villain's army, but he is only allowed to refer to him as General. Suddenly, Mr. Villain's co-worker enters his office and offers to join him for lunch in the cafeteria. He rudely instructs him to go away since he is busy. He's annoyed because there's a baby panda unveiling at the zoo while he's at work, but he calms down when he looks at the cute photo of the baby panda. He later enters the group office and notices the newcomer working. He acknowledges that his shift is done and dismisses him, but the rookie is eager to complete as much of the task as possible. The general looks over the paperwork and realizes that the majority of it is not urgent. He informs the newbie that they are fighting a long-term war and that Earth will fall in more than a single day. He encourages the newcomer to take care of his mind and body, else he will burn out eventually. Mr. Villain reminds him that they have the following day off, so he should make the most of it. As the boss departs, the newcomer is astounded that the general spoke to him and begins to research the greatest things he can do on his day off. He chooses to visit the zoo and is awestruck to see the pandas. The next day, he tells Mr. B Villain about his visit to the zoo, which was prompted by his report. He brings the general some panda-shaped chocolate as a token of thanks, and the boss compliments him. When Mr. K Villain returns home that night, he opens the chocolates but is unable to eat them since they are so adorable. He deems mankind barbarous before displaying the chocolate throughout his home till it expires. One night, he returns home from work fatigued and imagines how much nicer it would be if he had a pet panda to greet him. He wants pandas to coexist with them after humans is extinct, and he fantasizes about all the activities he would engage in with them, such as gaming. He wakes up the next morning on the floor, feeling as if his vision of a panda-filled planet has reinvigorated his determination to wipe out humanity. He visits the zoo when he discovers that panda tails are white, as is widely believed. However, he is unsure because the creature's ears and limbs are black, and he would like to confirm. The villain uses this as an excuse to get a yearly zoo pass since he will not believe the tail is white unless he sees it. He stood there with another kid for three hours before they saw it, which was white. The two fist bump one other for having the patience to wait thus long. He subsequently meets the same child in the petting zoo section. The little youngster instructs the villain how to properly treat the rabbits after disclosing that he aspires to be a veterinarian one day. The next day at work, the rookie goes by the general's office and guesses he is planning a strategy to wipe off humanity based on the concentrated expression on his face. But he's considering how he can persuade the League to allow bunnies in the workplace. Another day off arrives and he encounters Red on his way home from the shop. The ranger tries to attack him again, but he declines because he is off duty. He explains to Red that he is holding some eggs that he intends to use in a meal. Red admits that he enjoys the hot spring eggs dish, so he understands and moves to the side. After a while, Mr. 
villain returns with an umbrella and a coat for red. He also directs the guy back to the train station. The useless hero is amazed that the villain still refuses to fight, and the general walks away, knowing deep down that he does not want any issues on his cherished day off. Mr. Villain awakens after a good night's sleep, but moans about how cold the place is. He turns on the warmth and reaches for his phone. A countdown displays on his screen before a baby panda-themed show begins to stream. Their adorable antics cheer him up on this cold morning. However, a call from Rooney disturbs his happiness. His downcast countenance says it all. Rooney is the co-worker he consistently refuses to eat lunch with. Mr. Villain's rage boils over as he recalls all of the times Rooney has irritated him at work. He ends the conversation and returns to his video. Nonetheless, Rooney continues to phone him, prompting Mr. Villain to respond and tell Rooney that he is not permitted to call on his day off. A hologram of Rooney appears, but he wonders why the general isn't visible on his end. Mr. Villain threatens to end the call in the next two seconds if he doesn't have anything to say. Rooney panics and tells the general that it's about an earth monster, which piques Mr. Villain's interest. The man reveals that he has been examining accounts of a monster that arrives in the winter and inhabits human dwellings. Rooney confirms that the creature utilizes warmth to entice victims, then traps them in its belly. The unit leader deduces that it consumes humans and believes that this will work in their favor. Rooney agrees and is thinking about how they may use it to achieve their goals. Unfortunately, while Rooney was investigating, the thing ate him from the waist down. The general emerges and inquires about Rooney's current whereabouts. The man responds that he is in the control room. Mr. Villain is surprised to learn that their headquarters have already been penetrated. He leaps out of bed and instructs Rooney to hold on till he arrives. The person requests that the general get some mandarin oranges because they are critical while dealing with the monster and he forgot to prepare some. Mr. Villain believes that one should distract the opponent with their favorite meal. Fortunately, the general had purchased a box of oranges the previous day on the advice of a local woman. He snatches the package and runs out the door. He curses the earthlings as he travels across the skies. He comes at the headquarters and tears the control room door open while shouting Rooney's name. However, the man is sitting comfortably under a kotatsu, which is a table with a heater and blanket to keep people warm. Rooney, unashamed, bursts into tears of pleasure because the general saved him. Rooney wants to learn how to liberate himself from what he refers to as a wintertime monster because his boss is well versed in human society. He doesn't want to get up because he'll be cold, but he has been wanting to use the restroom for a while. Mr. Villain stands there stunned for a time before scooping up his box of oranges and walking inside. Rooney has not seen him with his hair down in a long time, so he comments on it. Mr. Villain simply strikes him in the head for his false flag. Soon, the general finds himself in the beast's guts, where Rooney feeds him oranges. Later that night, Mr. Villain overhears a woman tell her spouse how adorable her limited edition panda buns are. This interests him, so he hangs around to hear more. She reveals that they are available at the nearby convenience store. It's the season for Chinese buns, so she's eager to consume as many as possible. She splits the panda bun in half and shares it with her boyfriend. The pair ignores it and walks away, enjoying their snack. They are unaware that they have just committed a grievous offense by splitting the panda in front of Mr. Villain. He enters the convenience store and simply stares at the panda buns, picturing how they were torn apart. The attendant joins him as he stands there distraught. She joyfully informs him about the special edition panda buns that are available this month. The lady mentions how juicy they are, but it's a shame to eat them because they seem so lovely. Mr. Villain departs, relieved that she understands the panda bun dilemma. He decides he will need to work up the confidence to eat them. He returns to the store at a later date and begins with the original pork buns as recommended. Mr. Villain takes a mouthful right after leaving the market and the flavor hits him like a truck. The next day, he worked his way up through the various sorts of buns available in sequence. As he gets closer to the main event, his anxiousness grows slightly. After several days of bun eating instruction, he is ready to attempt the panda bun, only to discover that the panda bun has been changed with another one. Mr. Villain discreetly goes without purchasing anything because he had gathered up the courage to eat the panda bun. The following morning, the general awakens with Chinese buns on his thoughts. He goes to the kitchen and follows the instructions to prepare it, soaking the bun before wrapping it around a plate. He settings his microwave for one minute. As soon as the timer goes off, he opens the door to investigate it and is horrified to see it entirely flattened. 
He collapses to the floor in despair, yet he admits that it tastes authentic. Meanwhile, in Ranger's headquarters, Red has a similar issue with his pork bun. He also collapses to the floor in despair. Mugi says he wrapped it too tightly. Sora feels sad for the meat bun since she believes it wanted to be eaten in its original fluffy form, but has now been reduced to a plain pancake. Sora's brief speech makes Red feel guilty, causing him to cry. The two take out a unique dumpling-making container that promises to make fluffy beef buns. Mr. P villain has also purchased one and is impressed with how well it keeps the bun fluffy. While outside, Mr. P villain notices some children constructing snow bunnies. Once they go, he builds a larger one next to it. However, he takes it home and stores it in the refrigerator. He continues to check on it over the next few days until it finally melts. The next day at work, he is in a terrible mood because of the melting rabbit. Rooney and the newcomer are perplexed. Mr. Villain strolls through town to pay honor to the snow rabbit. He later goes to the zoo for some relaxing panda time. He comes at the world's longest steps and encounters an elderly guy straining to climb. The general offers to carry the elderly man's belongings. The senior citizen is grateful, and as they continue, Mr. Villain notices that the man is suffering and offers to carry him up. The old man accepts the offer. They finally reach the top of the stairs, and he remarks on the general's fine character. He asks if he will help him again, and Mr. Villain accepts, even though he has no idea what he will be doing. He sets the old guy down, and the senior gentleman waves him off. Mr. Villain believes the elderly man is senile, and has most likely mistaken him for his grandchild. Seeing him in that position makes him realize how transitory humans are, it's almost terrible to witness. That night, Mr. Villain falls asleep and dreams of the elderly man. The elderly man exposes himself to be Santa Claus and requests Mr. Much Villain to assist him in delivering his Christmas gifts. Mr. Villain wakes up bewildered about his dream the next morning since his body is aching. He comes out of bed and discovers that it is Christmas Day, but he considers it special because it is merely his day off. A guy is walking down a lonely street at night, looking completely exhausted and indistinct. He stops by the convenience store, and he's welcomed by Yamano, but he doesn't reply. He impulsively picks up a shopping basket. He just joined the workforce last summer, and he was looking forward to living on his own for the first time. He was also looking forward to having drinks with his friends at the end of the day. He had plans to go for gym sessions and travel to fun places during his days off. As much as he looked forward to this, he just didn't have the energy to do it. He is too lazy to do his laundry, and he doesn't have enough money to cook for himself. He didn't want to keep living like that, but he does anyway, and then becomes depressed by how much he sucks. He puts some items into his basket, and as he walks to the next aisle, he spots Warimono. Warimono is grinding his teeth and looking at a portion of the shelf. The lazy guy is petrified seeing Warimono covered in his frighteningly dark aura. He's now convinced that the rumors of dangerous people roaming downtown are true. He decides to keep his distance from Warimono, but Yamano comes around and Warimono's aura disappears. Yamano welcomes Warimono, and the lazy guy is surprised they are on good terms. Warimono asks Yamano why the Chinese buns are absent from the shelf, and she tells him they took it down because its promotion time ended. Warimono is bummed out to hear that he can't get his after-work treat. Yamano tells him he can reward himself with some new frozen treats since the buns aren't available anymore, and he tells her to show him the way. Yamano walks away and Warimono follows. The lazy guy starts reflecting on his life and his negative mindset. Though he knows there are some things he can't do, he decides to celebrate being hardworking. He looks down at his basket and smiles. He decides to get some pudding as his reward and takes it to Yamano who packs it up for him. She commends him for completing a day of good work, and she bids him farewell, handing him his purchase. He leaves the shop, happy he got a treat for himself. He continues his journey home, commending himself for being a hard worker. The next day he stops by the convenience store again, and this time he picks up a cherry blossom pudding. Yamano tells him the cakes just came in, and the store is doing a cherry blossom-themed promotion. She tells him the different treats that are cherry blossom flavored, and he asks her if the pudding is good, and she tells him it's her favorite. He happily adds it to his cart. Warimono got the cherry blossom flavored milk. He tries it while walking home, and he's surprised by the cherry blossom taste. He passes by a cherry blossom tree on his way home. He catches a falling leaf and puts it in his mouth to compare the taste, and he's satisfied. The next day, the lazy guy is at the convenience store, and he wonders what he'll get as a treat for himself. 
He's looking at the store's options when Waramono walks in. Yamano welcomes him, and she tells him she was worried he wasn't going to make it to the convenience store that day. The lazy guy is still surprised by how well they get along with each other. Yamano is about to tell Waramono something serious, but she seems a little hesitant. She flashily tells him they just got some new ice cream products and the new lazy guy wasn't expecting her to say that. Waramono leans in close and asks her to give him more information like it's a closely kept secret. She walks him in the direction of the new products and the lazy guy turns his attention back to what he wants to get. He didn't want to stare too much so he didn't seem rude. Yamano leads Waramono to a storage unit close to the lazy guy. She shows him the store's new collection and she recommends a flavor to him. The lazy guy tries to mind his business, but he can't help but eavesdrop on what Yamano is saying. She tells Waramono about another flavor the store has in stock, telling him they would be worthy snacks for him. Waramono observes the two new ice cream flavors and he agrees with Yamano, telling her they look delicious. The flavors of the ice cream also caught the lazy guy's attention. Waramono decides to get one flavor, but Yamano recommends the other flavor. Yamano apologizes for predicting his preference wrongly. The lazy guy doesn't want to see Waramono get angry, and he gets ready to bolt if he does. Waramono tells Yamano he'll trust her recommendations because they are always spot on. He decides to buy both flavors and do a taste test to determine which one he prefers. She apologizes for making him get both, and he tells her he would have come back another day to get the other one anyway. He tells her to check him out and they head over to the counter. The lazy guy looks at the storage unit with the new collection of products. He walks over and decides to get some ice cream as his treat. He contemplates which flavor he should get. Yamano packs up Waramono's purchases and hands it over to him. He leaves the store and she tells him to take care. The lazy guy finally settles on what to get. He gets both flavors of the new ice cream collection and he takes it to the counter. Yamano is surprised he took the flavors and she packs it up and hands it over to him. Waramono is walking home, gleefully looking forward to deciding which flavor he will try first. The next day is a day off for him and he knew he had all the time to decide. The next day, Waramono is walking down the street calmly. He is a high-ranking officer of the evil leagues that fight daily to eradicate humankind. They plan to claim the Earth as their home planet after they eventually conquer it. But since that was his day off, he decided to find a cafe and try out a latte art, both of which he didn't know about previously. He finds a shop and he walks into it. He's welcomed into the shop, which has a vinyl record player giving off soft tunes. He walks over to a table beside another customer and sits down. He looks at the brewing stand of the shop and he wonders if they are carrying out some form of experiment. The attendant asks him what he would like and Waramono tells him he wants a latte. The attendant begins preparing the cup and Waramono is baffled by the coffee-making process. He asks the barista what the machine is and he tells him it's a siphon coffee maker which the cafe has always used to make its coffee. He walks over to the other customer and pours him a cup. Waramono is surprised to learn that there are different ways to make coffee. The barista starts using an espresso machine and Waramono doesn't like the sound of it. He wonders why the attendant has to make so much noise just to make coffee. The barista brings Waramono's latte over to him and Waramono whips out his phone to take a picture. He thinks the cup lives up to the rumors and he wonders how he would go about drinking it. He looks at it from different angles, then he observes how the customer close to him drinks his. He takes a huge swig of his latte and he's surprised by how much the panda reduced. He puts down the cup and he feels bad for the little panda in his cup. He thinks those who created the concept of latte art are heartless. The panda tells him not to feel bad because it's his destiny. Waramono watches as the panda slowly melts away and he takes one final swig. The memory of the panda haunts Waramono and he feels bad. The customer feels for him and he orders another cup of latte art for Waramono. Waramono walks back home burdened by several bags he's carrying. He felt so much for the panda that he ended up buying too much latte art. The bags were so heavy they almost tripped him up. He also had a lot of milk in the bag to make a variety of meals. He knew he would be working for most days in the coming week, so he decided to use his free day to make some meals in advance. He had an idea to decorate his pudding and almond jelly with the panda art once he's done making them. He wanted to use that day as a trial run, and since he expected some failure, he decided to get extra milk to compensate for that. He stumbled upon some panda dishware which he bought to dish out his meals. 
Warmono finally gets back to his building, but he's faced with a huge flight of stairs that look impossible to climb. Getting back to his building with all his groceries intact was already a near-impossible feat that he managed to achieve. The stairs seem to extend to heaven and Warmono wonders why an elevator was not installed in the building. He decides to forget all about that and take his first step towards his liberation. He decides not to give in, and he keeps going up the flight of stairs. Each step he takes makes his shoulders and hands almost tear away from his body. He decides to encourage himself with the thought of the stew he'll make once he makes it to the top of the stairs. He begs his hands, legs and shoulders to hang on as he keeps climbing up the stairs. He's staring at the top of the stairs longingly, and he finally reaches it. He kneels to bask in it, the glory of getting to the top of the flight, but the lazy guy from the convenience store stands there and stares at him confusingly. They exchange greetings. On his next day off, Warumono decides to key into a tradition of the humans. He decides to go see the cherry blossoms in full bloom, but when he arrives, the flowers have already fallen. He even went through the trouble of making lunch for the occasion, and he can't believe he didn't get to watch the flowers fall. He remembers when a presenter on TV said that watching cherry blossoms without a packed lunch just doesn't give the same experience. He looks at the tree disappointed, and then he notices a little girl picking up the fallen flowers from the tree. They stare at each other for an awkwardly long time, saying nothing. Then the girl drops the flowers, and she grabs hold of Warumono's lunch that he's holding out to her. They settle down on the public bench under the cherry blossom, and the girl begins to munch down on his lunch. Warumono asks her if her parents didn't teach her to never accept food from strangers. The little girl doesn't reply, but she continues munching away at his lunch. He asks her if she is really that hungry to not be bothered about. She doesn't reply, she just keeps munching on her newfound lunch. Warumono slaps his face in disappointment of the human race, and he vows to wipe humanity off the face of the planet for sure. The girl asks him if she can have one more rice ball, and he tells her to take as many as she wants. She begins munching on the rice ball. She asks him if he came to see the cherry blossom flowers, and he tells her that was his plan, but it seems he was too late. He pours out some tea from his flask and holds it out to her, telling her to chew her food properly. She tells him she'll show him the cherry blossom flowers. She opens her hands and some flowers scatter with the wind. Warumono figures out that, unlike the flora in his home planet which retains its flowers till they wither, the cherry blossom tree scatters its petals shortly after they bloom. He's surprised that humans find that phenomenon fascinating. He watches as the cherry blossoms float around in the wind and he's mesmerized. He finally understands why humans love watching the blossom fall. He tells the girl the sight is truly beautiful, but he doesn't get a reply. He turns to see a pile of cherry blossom flowers where the girl was once sitting. He wondered if the girl left him and decided to head home. After that day, Warumono went back several times to that cherry blossom tree with a packed lunch to watch the flower fall, but he never encountered her again. He decides to go visit the following year when the tree is in full bloom. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.